I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, as we dig into this this day. And um, what I'm starting today is a uh, new topic that's going to last a few weeks, and it's called Project Live. Project Live. You know, life is kind of important, isn't it? Don't we struggle and strive and do everything that we can to stay alive? And in that process of staying alive, we like to avoid pain. For example, if you take your hand and put it on something hot, what do you naturally do? You pull it back because it hurts, right? Because, you know, we want a pain-free life as well as a, as a life. And, you know, we talk about living a life well-lived and all those kinds of things. And as I was trying to come up with a title for this series you know, uh, it came across, well, maybe we should go, do, you know, YOLO in Christ. You only live once and then put on the in Christ. But really, you know, um, in a sense, we live more than once because we're here and then there's eternity. And you live in once, you know, it depends on where you go at the turn of the road, whether you go with Christ or whether you go off with uh, the devil and end up in a hot spot. So I decided to call it Project Live. And today I've got a really important question that I want us to seek answer to. And the important question is, what am I doing here? Have you ever asked that kind of a question, what am I doing here? That's the title of today. What am I doing here? I remember when I went off to basic training back in the day and, and that bus pulled up and, uh, on base and, and that TI, that training instructor, is what we called them in the Air Force, uh, when they, he stepped onto the bus and he started screaming and yelling and Man, I heard obscenities that I'd never even heard in my life. I said, what am I doing here? Anybody ever have that experience? Maybe it's in the Marine Corps, maybe it was the Army or the Navy or the Coast Guard or, or whatever. And, and you had that kind of an experience. What am I doing here? Or maybe, you know, you were on the football field and, and, and it was the fourth quarter and, and you were just getting beat up in a terrible way and your, your team was down. I mean, you were getting beat like 50 to nothing and you're on the nothing side. You're kind of like a, you know, you're playing for Tennessee. <laughs> I, couldn't let that go. I couldn't let that slide, Matt. We'll see. I doubt it. <laughs> and you say, what am I doing here? You know, what am I doing here? Well, the Apostle Paul writes and he talks to us really about what we're doing here. In Ephesians chapter 1. Now, this entire uh, text, I'm going to focus on one verse, but I want to read beginning in verse 1 of Ephesians 1, in which Paul writes and says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. By the will of God. You know, when I look at Paul and I look at his life, man, he was, he was kind of messed up to begin with. You know, he was going around slapping Christians, killing Christians, you know, hating the church, hating Christ. Yet God had a plan for Paul's life outside of Paul's mess-ups. So that's just a commentary. It's not even part of the message so much. To the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. God chose us. You were not the last pick. You were not the final pick. You were not the one uh, that was being tossed from side to side. No, you take Him. God chose us that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, which, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. Now, here's our text verse. In Him we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. And so, when I begin to ask that kind of a question, what am I doing here? I find that God 
has an answer as to what I'm doing here. Eugene Peterson, in his message uh, translation, which is more like a commentary, he said it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. And so there are three basic questions that we have to answer in life as, as we uh, ask the question, what am I doing here? And the first one is really, you know, that, a repeat of that question, why do I live? You know, why do I live? What's the purpose of my existence? Am I made just to get up and go through the routine day after day? Why do I live? You know, that's the question of our existence. And when we can find an answer to that, we have to answer another question. Well, does my life matter? Does my life matter to anyone besides me? Does my life matter to God? You know, that's the question of our significance. And, and then the third question is, if, if, uh, if I know why I live and if I know that my life matters, you know, what is the purpose of my life? What is the intention of my life? And so today, I want to try to, to bring answer and, bro- uh, and broaden that out a little bit because I want to take you on a journey over the next several weeks to help us to really begin to, to live our life intentionally, not only before God and not only among one another, but as individuals alive for this project of living and so the very first, question, very first question is, why do I live, you know? And, and that's not a new question. It's been asked for thousands of years. There's a dude in the Old Testament by the name of Jeremiah. You may have come across his name there. He's got several pages there that uh, he's listed as the author. He's known as the weeping prophet. I think Jeremiah, much like us, looked over the city of Jerusalem and he wept. But he looked over the city of Jerusalem and he wept because it seemed as people were living without intention. It seemed as if people were living without purpose. It seemed without, as people were living without a knowledge of God, a fear of God, a reverence for God. And, and certainly there were religious people there. But, you know, you can have a lot of religion and yet never have the spiritual power, the spiritual unction that God so desires that we have. And so Jeremiah asked this question. He said, why did I come out from the womb? Why did I come out from the womb? To see toil and and sorrow and to spend my days in shame? And, you know, some of you may feel that way. You know, were we born simply to have problems? Were we born simply to be pro- to have problems? How many of you have ever had a problem? Now, I want to tell you something. I, I saw this this morning on Twitter, and it's got to be true. If you are alive today, everybody hold up your hand. You're alive. And everybody's had a problem, right? Keep your hand up. You are 100% successful at making it through the problem. Ever thought about it that way? Isn't that cool? You know, you're 100% successful at making it through the problem. And and, and so, you know, we we all face these things. And philosophers ask that question, you know, why am I alive? Am I alive to face problems? What's the purpose of life? And so the world, you know, it has these answers that it gives us. And, and, um, you know, life without a purpose really isn't worth living. So we need to understand why we're here. And and so, you know, there's uh, there's this mystical religious approach that says, I'm going to look within. I'm going to look in my heart. I'm going to look in my soul. I'm going to look in my being. I'm going to discover who I am. Well, I've looked around, and when I look at me, I still come up with nothing. And when I, when I look within, I think, man, I've got the religious rules down, you know, and I carry the big honking Bible, and, and, and now I've moved up. I carry uh, my message notes on an iPad, and, and, and I've got glasses uh, that Dr. Malega uh, got fixed fix me up with, you know, so I can see. I'm still empty when I look at it that way. And, you know, some people, you know, they take the philosophical approach. They say, well, well, we're here to survive. We're not here to simply survive. We've been, according to the text, given every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. We've been created to survive, to do more than survive. We've been created to thrive. And so, you know, there's no point in living on a survivalist level. I was thinking about living on a survivalist level earlier today. I don't want to live just as a survivalist. And the hedonist, you know, that pleasure seeker says, man, we're here to have fun. We are here to have fun. That's what the Corinthians said. The Corinthians said, hey, man, I've got this belly. How many of you have a belly? You know? And what's this belly made for? Come on, you know. It's made for food, chocolate. Who said chocolate? 
Nancy. That belly's made for chocolate. It's made for food, right? And food is made for what? My belly, right? That's what the Corinthians said. Hey, the belly's made for food. The food's made for the belly. Let's have a good time and party on. You know, it's about pleasure. It's about how much fun I can have. And then the materialist says, well, man, it's about, it's about gaining notoriety. It's about success. And, you know, we live that materialist level on, on, at every age. You know, when, as, as we're growing older, we, you know, we want to acquire a lot of stuff and have a lot of stuff. But maybe when we're in high school, we're thinking about being that star football player this year, going into our senior year. And we're hoping that Tennessee doesn't try to recruit us. Matt, I think you're the only Tennessee fan in the room this morning. We're praying for you too, Patty. But, but anyway, it's, it's, it's gaining that thing. And you know, don't we like to have stuff? How many of you have a lot of stuff? Come on, be honest. We've all got a lot of stuff. But you know what I've discovered? Is he who dies with a lot of stuff still dies. So materialism is, is not the, the answer that, that we need. So, you know, we go and say, okay, I'm going to help myself. And we go and, man, there's hundreds of self-help books over there on the shelves at Barnes & Noble and over at Books A Million. And you'll even find a few at Lifeway. Right? And so you dig in, and there's all these kinds of things. And, and, and it talks about creating our purpose and discovering our dreams and going after our dreams and, and having ambitions and, 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 and aiming high and believing that you can make it. And all those things are good, you know, and, 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 and they help you a little bit. They all give you ideas to have success in life. But grab a hold of this. Being a success will never sh really show you why you live. Being a success will never really show you why you live. You see, the purpose of life is far greater than our own personal fulfillment looking within. The purpose of life is far greater than our own personal happiness. It's not all about me. And it's far greater than our own personal peace of mind. You see, you were made by God. You were created by God. You know, when something brings question in your mind about the car that you drive, what do you turn to? The owner's manual, right? What kind of oil does my car take? I go to the owner's manual and find out that it takes 5W30 or whatever else, you know, brake fluid, dot three, whatever it may be. I go and I find that out. Well, if I want to understand why I'm here, I've got to go to the owner's manual. In other words, I've got to go to God's Word. And I've got to begin to, to discover according to what God has to say as to why I'm here. So God gives us an answer. Why does He want us here? Why are we alive? Why do we inhabit the planet? Well, Solomon, the smartest, wisest man who ever lived, he said in Proverbs 16, verse 4, he said, The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Everything has a purpose. Now, I'm sure one day when we get to heaven, we'll want to know what the purpose of those mosquitoes were. You know, or, or you know, we might ask the question, you know, what's the purpose of, of, of spiders? You know, I ask that occasionally. I really know what the purpose of spiders are. You know, they're to get their webs in my face as I go through the woods looking for my golf ball. It's supposed to be funny. But I know there's many others like me like that because the other day I had to go in the woods for my golf ball and I threw out another dozen balls from that very same spot and still didn't find mine. But a dozen balls out still counts as me finding my ball, right? But really, the reason I'm here, according to what this Bible, what the Word has to say, that God's made everything for a purpose. The reason that we live is for His purpose. The reason I live is for His purpose. God never created anything without a purpose. And right now, you know, you're alive. Your heart's beating. Did you know that? I, I can check my Fitbit. I've, I've walked 3,369 steps this morning, and my heart's beating at 67 uh, beats per minute. So my heart's alive. It's beating. And guess what? You may not have on the Fitbit, but 
your heart's beating, you're sitting here. And as long as your heart's beating, God's got a plan and He's got a purpose for you right here. And I want us to focus on the reason that God has put us on the planet. What's God's motive? Well, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 4, in which he says, uh, uh, Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love. In other words, this is what God is doing. God is created, has created us, and he says that you were created to be loved by God. God created man to, to have fellowship with man. God created man in his own image. God created man that we might come and wa- worship and walk with God. But we messed up. We fail. You know, we have the beauty of creation, but we've got the horror of the fall of man with our sinfulness and, and our pride and all that stuff. But God created us that we might be loved by Him. He created us to love us, and He created us that we might love Him. That's why I'm here. But the second question that I want to try to bring answer to in a short period of time this morning then, you know, if I'm here because God loves me and I'm here to love God, you know, does my life really matter? Does my life really matter? You know, that's really the question of our significance You know, we all want to know that we're significant on one level or another. Does my life really matter? Isaiah wrote these words in Isaiah chapter 49, verse number 1, in which he said, But I said, I have labored in vain, I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Do you ever feel like that? You know, we've labored in vain. But, but what we find is that God created us. He created us for meaning and purpose. And if you don't have meaning and purpose in your life, it just doesn't make sense. And you know, for so many people, they just go through, they just go through the motions every day. They go through the routine every day. You know, we all have routine. I've been away on vacation, you know, for the past week. And, and so our routine's been kind of broken up. But it kind of felt good to wake up this morning and have my routine, you know, to wake up and drink a glass of water and pour a cup of coffee and, and, and to sit down and, and to, you know, walk out the door and smell the fresh air and get hit in the face with another crazy spider web. You know, every morning bright and early they get me. And so, you know, we, we, we find ourselves sometimes getting by. We find ourselves sometimes just existing. We find ourselves not really living. We're controlled by the circumstances. We're in the rut. And a rut's nothing more than a grave with the ends knocked out. That's all it is. And so some of you find yourself, you know, you're living at that survival level. You're just existing. You know, I was thinking about that in Papua New Guinea 13 years ago in October. We had a team of 25 or 26 of us here from Village Baptist that went over there for 21 days in Papua New Guinea. Now, Papua New Guinea was really neat. It was really a a cool place. I mean, we went and we lived in the jungle. We lived and slept in uh, mosquito nets. And I found this really cool blow-up mattress that worked on batteries. I bought it at Sears, and I'd packed and carried with me to have something nice and soft to sleep on. Only problem is it holds water, so every morning I'd wake up and I'd be in a puddle of sweat because it never dropped down below about 85 degrees and the humidity and all that good stuff. The people were tribal. And I was thinking about them this morning as I was going through my notes, and I was thinking about how they survive. You know, every day they get up, they're in the same tribe. There's over 838 different tribes in Papua New Guinea, and there's 838 different languages. So they don't communicate with the other tribes so well, except through a trade language called pidgin. And every day they're beating out the roots, and they're making mush, and they're catching fish, and... They smile and their teeth are just as red as they can be. There's some kind of a berry they chew on all the time. And every man and boy walks around with a machete in their hand. And they're just surviving. But aren't so many people just surviving today? They just survive. And then, you know, there are those that live on the success level. And on that success level, you know, uh, by the world standards, every one of us in this room have made it. I mean, you think about those tribal people in Papua New Guinea, you know, that might trade a pig for a wife and then want their pig back. (laughs) 
We're, we've, we've made it pretty well. Because, you know, when, when I left Papua New Guinea, I, I took a shower when we landed in, Al- in Australia, in Sydney. I think we're spending the night there. And, um, and I remember, you know, in that white shower stall, all this black dirt coming off of me. And I thought I'd been bathing. And man, air conditioning felt really good. And the soft seat felt really good. You know, we have arrived. You know, we're, we're successful. But I think one of the questions that comes along is, if I am so successful, why am I so unfulfilled? And we'll never be fulfilled until we reach this third level of, that we call the level of significance. It's where we need to live, where we have understood that I am here because God loves me and I love God. I'm here and, and I, I matter to God, and, and that gives me significance. And I've got a purpose to live for. Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 44 too. He says, Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb, and will help you. You know, God's not here just to slap you around and knock you down and keep you low. He's the God who helps us. He says, Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. And, and, and you see, we've got to understand something. God is for us, and God was taking care of us before we were ever formed in the womb. David said in Psalm 139, he said, Your eye saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So God knew me even before I was formed. And God had the days of my life laid out before there were any of them. And man, those days, they really go fast, don't they? I mean, we think about that that song that, that Matt just led us in, you know, like a flower quickly fading. Like the grass is here today and gone tomorrow. Like the waves tossed on the ocean. Man, our life is zipping by. I mean, have you looked in the mirror lately? I mean, think about it. You look in the mirror and think, where did those years go? You know, what's happened? You know, things change. I went to the dermatologist about a little over a week ago and had a little spot or two cut. And the nurse said, don't worry, Mr. Davies. Said it'll be just like baby skin when it heals. But the problem is, you know, that baby skin's only a spot about that big around. I need baby skin all over, right? Do you feel that way? And, and, and so, you know, we, we are, we're aging. You know, life is passing. When you're 15 going on 16, it feels like that year passes so slow until you can get your license and drive out of the driveway all by yourself, on your own, independent, without a parent sitting beside you telling you to hit the brake and to flip on the signal and to buckle your seatbelt and all that different kinds of stuff. And that tells me something. That I matter to God. It tells me that, that you matter to God. God uh, says, you know, that, that His counsel stands forever. That means, you know, that God has given us guide, a guide to live by. His counsel stands forever. It wasn't written just for Jeremiah's sake. It wasn't written just for David's sake in the Psalms. It wasn't written just because Moses decided to write five books in the opening of the Bible. It wasn't written just for the people back in the New Testament days, because we're still in the New Testament days. This is still the age of the church. And get this. It's a word for all time. You know, we sing a song around here, it's called Ancient Words. It goes, ancient words, ever true, words for me and words for you. God gives us counsel. He gives us direction that we might live. And so God says that we were made to last forever. He says, I was made to to last forever. But yet I look in the mirror. Man, and those years have slipped by. Where'd that wrinkle come from? Where'd that spot come from? Where's that gray hair coming from? Where'd those hairs go? All that different kind of stuff. And Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and he talked about that, and he said, for we know, this is what we know. He says, for we know that if, Our earthly tent is destroyed. Now, what he's referring to there is he's referring to this body. We live in a tent. Tents are temporary. They're not made for eternity. And we know that when this earthly tent is destroyed, that we have a building from God, a house made not with hands that's eternal in the heavens. That means one day, you know, we're going to go off to glory. 
and we're going to have baby skin. One day we're going to go off to glory, and we're going to know the joy and the presence of the Lord. Now, one of my, my kids, we were on vacation this week. The first time in over 10 years we've had everybody together on vacation in one spot. And so one of my boys informed me, Dad, did you know that for every extra person you have on vacation, it, distri- it uh, diminishes your happiness by 15%? <laughs> So I figure I was at least 90% down, maybe 105% down. Because there's eight of us total, that put us, counting the other seven, that put me at 105% down. But the Bible says we're going to heaven, where we're going to have baby skin. How do I know that? Well, I do some speculation here because the Bible's not absolutely clear on everything, but it says we're getting a new body, right? We're going to be like him. And you know what? Jesus was in the prime of his life. Remember when you were in your prime? When you're great, as great as you once thought you were? In that prime? And you know, I used to not be too excited about going to heaven because all the preachers I had growing up said, Man, when we get to heaven, we're going to stand and sing. We're going to sing on Jordan's stormy banks I stand for for eternity. And then we're going to pray a while. I thought, oh man, that sounds kind of boring. Have you ever thought that? Come on, be honest. I mean, have you ever been in a worship service when you thought, is this singing ever going to stop? (laughs) Really, have you ever been there? Now, Matt, I want you to look around. Just look. Stand up and look around. There's only a few hands. Now listen to this. Have you ever been to that worship service where you thought, will the preacher ever wrap it up? Put your hands up. Look at that. Man, you music guys, you just always have it, don't you? You get to go to Hawaii. I get to go to the, what's that desert? The Sahara. (laughs) They won't listen to you sing all the time. They're ready for me to quit. They're already looking at their watch saying, it's almost time to go eat lunch. If we hurry, we can beat the Methodists to Pepito's. Okay, let's move on so we can do that. Where was I going with this? But heaven's going to be a glorious place. He said he's creating a new heaven and a new earth. And I I didn't even mean to get into all of that. But but the Lord, he encourages us through the Proverbs to 9.6, in which he says, leave your simple ways. Leave your simple ways. You know, don't live as a survivalist. Don't live as a materialist. Don't live as a hedonist. But live as a a person who's focused on God and live and walk in the way of insight. In other words, walk as if you have meaning. So finally, we get to this last question. What is my purpose then? You know, my intention. The psalmist says, remember how short my time is. For what vanity have you created all the children of man? You know, David's talking to God. You know, and he's talking to God in that kind of a a way. And God, you know, there's no reason for me to be here except for you. Think about that. There's no reason for you to be alive today except for God. There's no reason for anything to exist except for God. And and, and so if there's no God, maybe, you know, some people feel feel that way. You know, you're nothing more than a a freak of science. I think Rick Warren put it this way. You know, you are a, um, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're a um, evolved something that came out of the water. He called it complex pond scum. Complex pond scum. Say that five times really fast. We want to be more than complex, you know. We want to be more than that. And the only way that you'll know your purpose is to look to God, is to look to have an encounter with God. And, 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 you know, we... He's given us an owner's manual. He's given us the tools that that we may know Him. Now, we use things and we live for things that are not designed for their use and and not designed for our life. For example, I remember many years ago, we'd gotten a new car. We'd finally moved out of the shoebox on wheels, which is a full-size van, and we'd gotten a Suburban. And man, that thing drove so good. And and, uh, the boys, they were going to do me a favor. They were out washing the car. And they had a steel wool pad 
on the new shiny wheel of that car. That steel wool pad was not designed for that wheel. I freaked out asking. You remember that? <laughs> it's him, not me. <laughs> but, you know, I freaked out. You know, sometimes we use the wrong tool that has a purpose for the wrong purpose, don't we? And sometimes we live in the wrong way and for the wrong purpose for, the, for what we're not designed for. And, and so, the only way we're going to know our purpose is not, you know, by talking to a philosopher, not by reading through the self-help books, and not by looking within, and not by having more fun, and not by gathering more stuff. you got to talk to God, the Creator who designed us and put us together. And in Genesis 1-1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning. It all starts with God, it all continues with God, and it all ends with God. So the proverb is said once again, Proverbs 9.10, he says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. And so, God's truth is this, I find my purpose in getting to know God. God, right? Now, Paul, you know, he he restated Ephesians 1 in another way in Colossians 1. In verse 16, he said, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers of authorities. All things were created through him and for him. So all things find their purpose in God. So I want to challenge you. And here's a challenge. This is the takeaway, okay? You've got a note sheet. You've been taking notes of this message. And on the back, on the top, here's your homework assignment for the week. We're going to do this for the next several weeks. I want to challenge you to read through the book of 1 John. 1 John, the epistle of 1 John. Not the gospel of John, but the epistle of 1 John. And I want you to end that reading... To say, God, I'm looking to you. God, I'm looking to you. I'm looking to you to know why I'm here. I'm looking to you to know my purpose, my significance. I am looking to you. Because Ephesians tells us, and I'm going to wrap it up with the message translation of verse 11. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up. He had his eyes on us. He had designs for our glorious living. So if you want to know God's purpose in your life, then you've got to get to know God. And part of that getting to know God is also in getting to know ourselves. So 1 John, this week, there's only a few chapters there. You can read through it in 10 minutes, but take your time and read 1 John. And over the next... Seven weeks, about 49 days, we're going to do, do, have some incredible things happen. You know, God can do great things. Uh, matter of fact, in the, New Te- in, the, in the Bible, there's a lot of things that God does, you know, in 40 days. Noah had a 40-day experience in the ark. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Anybody been to see this uh, new ark exhibit yet? How was that? Beautiful. Brenda and Terry have been up in the mountains all summer long. About time y'all got back down here. And, uh, and they got to see it. I, I look forward to seeing it. And Moses on Mount Sinai, when he went to receive the Ten Commandments, 40 days and a great transformation. Think about Jesus, 40 days of fasting and prayer in the wilderness before he began his public ministry. And let me tell you something. God wants to do something in your life. He wants to do something in the life of this church. He wants to do something in the life of this this nation. And then right here in the middle of this 40 days comes September the 11th. The reason we're having 49 days. And on September the 11th, it happens to be a Sunday 
this year. And I'm just looking for God to do something incredible in His church. As we have a special 9-11 prayer service that morning, it's all part of our worship and what God is doing in and through us. So, this is my challenge. Over the next week, read 1 John. Everybody got that? We're going to read what? Okay, you're going to commit to it. And so, you see, in the book of Acts, the Bible says this. This is the message. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to do what, do as he says, the door's open. You know, Jesus is the, is the Christ of the outstretched arm. He says, I love you, and I care for you, and I invite you to come to me. You're looking to God, 1 John, and then here's the second part of the challenge. You can write this down right under 1 John. Seven minutes over the next seven days, seven by seven. That is, I am going to spend seven minutes in prayer each day for the next seven days. Why seven minutes? I don't know. It met up with seven. But you know, seven minutes is longer than you can imagine. And you know, you're praying along and you look at your watch. Man, it's been 30 seconds. I thought it had to be at least 10 minutes. But if you'll just talk to God, that's all it is, just talking to God and listening to God. Man, that seven minutes will pass. And you don't have to hold it at seven, but you can go all the way. He's the God of the open door. He invites you to come. He invites you to come and respond to his call in your life and say, I am thine, O Lord. I have heard your voice. I'm going to pray, and then I want to invite you. Some of you for the very first time, want to come and say, Pastor, I want to look to God. We want to help you do that. Some of you want to come and say, I want to join this church body. Some of you just might want to bow at this altar and make it the commitment. Lord, help me to read 1 John and to do the 7 by 7 prayer. God, be glorified in my life and in your church. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you, thanking you for your tender mercies in our life. And Lord, thanking you that we're more than complex pond scum, but we're beautifully and wonderfully made by you. We thank you, Lord, that we're valuable to you, that you've looked on us in love. And Lord, that you have sent redemption our way through Christ Jesus. Father, I pray that in this moment of decision that people will respond to your redemption. I pray that your church will continue to prosper and grow. And Heavenly Father, that in all of our lives you'll be honored and that we'll rise to live at the level of significance. To you be the glory and the honor and the praise. For it's in Christ we pray, amen. Let's stand together as we sing. Would you come? Take up that cross and follow after Christ.